the day, we're going to be diving into, well, all the complexities of post-surgical care in the ICU. I mean, yeah. as healthcare providers working in the ICU, as yeah. you already know, there's so much to monitor, so many potential complications. So how do you stay on top of it all without feeling overwhelmed? Well, one really powerful tool is a mnemonic called Fast Hugs BID. Fast Hugs BID. Yes. Right they on. can help you manage these patients effectively. So this is like a mental checklist. Yeah. Specifically designed for surgical patients mm -hmm. to make sure we're hitting all the key areas. Yeah. And giving them the best possible care. Exactly. It's like a roadmap to ah. guide you through the complexities of post-surgical care. Okay. I like that, a roadmap. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the history of Fast Hugs BID. Where did this mnemonic come from? It actually evolved over time. It started as a way to remember basic care elements, and it was just called Fast Hug. Fast Hug. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Things like feeding, I... pain relief, yeah. and preventing ulcers. Okay, the essential. Exactly. But as critical care evolved, experts realized that surgical patients have some unique needs. Right, because just because they're in the ICU, yeah. they have a whole different set of challenges compared to other patients. Exactly. So they added more elements, and that's how we got Fast Hugs BID. Fast Hugs BID, gotcha. So what are some of those unique challenges that surgical patients face that made it necessary to expand the mnemonic? Well, surgical patients often have issues that are directly related to their surgery, okay. like collapsed lungs, which is called basal atelectasis, okay. bowel problems like paralytic ileus, Makes sense. surgical site infections, of course. bleeding, uh -huh. and even leaks from where the intestines were reconnected, okay. which are called anastomosis leaks. So these are all things that we wouldn't necessarily see yeah. in a patient who wasn't post-surgical. Right. And Fast Hugs BID helps you remember yeah. to watch out for these specific issues. Okay, so let's dive into each element of this mnemonic yeah. and really understand how it's tailored for our surgical patients. Let's start with F. F is for feeding. So what's unique about feeding for surgical patients? Well, one of the first things to consider is whether the patient can even eat or drink right away after surgery. Right. Sometimes they need to be NPO, which means nil by mouth. NPO. Got this period of time to allow their gut to rest and heal. Okay. So in those cases, yeah. how do we provide them with nutrition? Well, we can use a feeding tube that delivers nutrients directly into their stomach. Okay. And sometimes they even need intravenous nutrition. Intravenous nutrition. Yeah. So that's like bypassing the gut altogether. Exactly. It's yeah. called total parenteral nutrition or TPN. TPN. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of that. So how do you decide which feeding method is best for a particular patient? Well, we consider a lot of factors. The type of surgery they had, okay. their overall condition, and any underlying medical problems. So for example... Mm -hmm. after a major abdominal surgery, yeah. you might need to be more cautious with feeding. Exactly. In those cases, we might start with TPM or a feeding tube mm -hmm. and then transition to oral feeding yep. once the gut has had time to heal. Okay. That makes sense. So we're really tailoring the feeding plan to the individual patient's needs yeah. and their surgical procedure. Exactly. Okay. I like that. So that's F for feeding. Let's move on to A. A is for analgesia. Now, pain management is crucial after surgery. How do we assess pain in these patients? Well, we want to make sure our patients are as comfortable as possible. So okay. we use a pain scale to assess their pain level. So like a zero to 10 scale. Exactly. Zero being no pain and 10 being the worst possible pain. Okay. And then based on their pain score, yeah. we can adjust their pain medication accordingly. Right. We want to make sure they're getting adequate pain relief, mm. but we also want to avoid over sedation. Makes sense. We need to find that sweet spot. Exactly. Okay. So we've covered F for feeding and A for analgesia. Let's move on to S. S is for sensorium. Now, I noticed that in the original fast hug mnemonic, mm -hmm. this element was sedation. So why the change from sedation to sensorium? Like, well, we realized that we need to look beyond just how sedated the patient is. We need to assess their overall mental state. Okay. So sensorium is a broader term yeah. that encompasses their level of consciousness, mm -hmm. their awareness. Yeah and their cognitive function. So it's about being more comprehensive in our assessment. Exactly. So how do we actually assess sensorium in our surgical patients? Well, we use a variety of tools. One common tool is the Glasgow Coma Scale, or GCS. As he says. Yeah. It helps us evaluate their level of consciousness right. based on their eye opening, verbal response, mm. and motor response. So it's a standardized way to track their neurological status. Exactly. Okay. And it's important to communicate these scores clearly. 
among the healthcare team. Absolutely. Clear communication is crucial to yeah. ensure everyone is on the same page yeah. about the patient's neurological status. Okay. So we've covered F for feeding, A for analgesia, and S for sensorium. T actually stands for three things, thromboprophylaxis, temperature, and tubes. These are all important considerations for surgical patients, and they often go hand in hand. Okay. Let's break it down. Thromboprophylaxis. Hmm. That's all about preventing blood clots. Exactly. Blood clots are a risk after surgery, especially if the patient is immobile. Right. So we use medications mm -hmm. and sometimes mechanical devices to prevent clots from forming. Okay. And what about temperature? Monitoring temperature is crucial because fever can be a sign of infection. Right. And infection is a serious complication after surgery. Gotcha. And then tubes. Surgical patients often have a lot of tubes. They do. They can have drains catheters, and even tubes for breathing. Like a ventilator. Exactly. So we need to manage all of these tubes carefully to prevent complications. Absolutely. Can you give me an example of a type of tube that needs extra attention? Sure. Let's say a patient has a chest tube. A chest tube. Yeah. This tube helps drain fluid or air from around the lungs. Yep. We need to make sure it's positioned correctly right. and that it's training properly. Okay. We also need to watch for signs of infection. Like redness or swelling. Exactly. Okay. So T is for thromboprophylaxis, temperature, and tubes. Let's move on to H. H is for head up position and hemodynamics. Why is the head up position so important for our surgical patients? Well, keeping the head of the bed elevated right. actually helps prevent a very common problem in the ICU called ventilator-associated pneumonia. Ventilator-associated pneumonia. Yes. Okay. When patients lie flat, their secretions can pool in their lungs, which makes them more likely to develop pneumonia. That makes sense. But by elevating the head of the bed, mm -hmm. we help those secretions drain away, and that reduces the risk of infection. Okay, so it's a simple intervention, but it can make a big difference. Absolutely. And what about hemodynamics? Hemodynamics refers to the patient's blood pressure, heart rate, yeah. and other vital signs. Okay. Monitoring these closely is crucial after surgery to make sure the patient is stable. Right. We need to make sure their heart and circulation are functioning properly. Exactly. Okay. So that's H for head up position and hemodynamics. Let's move on to U. U is for ulcer prophylaxis mm -hmm. and urine output. These are both still very important elements of care. Okay. Let's start with ulcer prophylaxis. Why do we need to worry about ulcers in our surgical patients? Critically ill patients are at risk for developing stress ulcers. These are ulcers that form in the stomach or intestines due to the stress of their illness. Okay. And surgery adds an extra layer of stress. So we give medication to reduce stomach acid production and help prevent these ulcers from forming. Okay. That makes sense. And what about urine output? Urine output is a great indicator of how well the kidneys are working. We want to make sure the kidneys are adequately perfused and that they're filtering waste products effectively. What are some red flags in urine output that would concern you in a post-surgical patient? Well, if the urine output suddenly drops, okay. that could be a sign of a problem. Like what? It could indicate dehydration okay. or a kidney problem okay. or even a blockage in the urinary tract. So it's something we need to pay close attention to. Absolutely. Okay. So that's you for ulcer prophylaxis and urine output. Let's move on to G. G is for glycemic control. Now, is this really that important for surgical patients? Glycemic control, which means keeping blood sugar levels in a healthy range is important for all critically ill patients, Okay. including surgical patients. So it's not just for patients with diabetes. Right. High blood sugar can delay healing okay. and increase the risk of infections. So we want to keep those blood sugar levels under control. Okay. Now we're getting to the BID part of the mnemonic which stands for bowel function, uh. indwelling catheters and imbalance, and drugs and delirium. Let's start with B for bowel function. Why is this so important for our surgical patients? Well, bowel function is crucial for overall recovery, and it's especially important after abdominal surgery. Right, because we've disrupted the normal function of the intestines. Exactly. So what are we specifically watching for? We're looking for the return of bowel sounds. Okay. We're also watching for bowel movements. And we're checking for any signs of abdominal distension. Abdominal distension. Yeah. Okay. It could be a sign of ileus. Ileus. Yes. That's where the bowels basically stop working. Exactly. It's a common complication after abdominal surgery. And it can be very uncomfortable for the patient. It definitely can. Okay. So we're monitoring for the return of bowel function. Yeah. And watching for any signs of ileus. Right. What about gastroparesis? Gastroparesis is another 
potential problem. Right. It's basically delayed stomach emptying. So food sits in the stomach longer than it should, which can cause nausea and vomiting. And that can delay their recovery. Absolutely. Okay. So bowel function is a big one. Let's move on to I. I is for indwelling catheters and imbalance. What kinds of catheters are we talking about here? We're talking about all the catheters that are placed inside the body. Okay. Like central venous catheters or CVCs. CVCs. Yeah, arterial lines. Okay. Epidural catheters oh, wow. and Foley catheters. So these are all tubes that are inserted into different parts of the body mm -hmm. for various purposes. Exactly. What do you mean by imbalance? Imbalance refers to electrolyte imbalances okay. and cumulative fluid balance. Right. Because surgical patients often require intravenous fluids mm -hmm. and medications, which can affect their electrolyte levels and their overall fluid status. So we need to monitor these carefully. Mm-hmm and make adjustments as needed. Absolutely. Can you give me an example of a potential electrolyte imbalance mm -hmm. and its implications? Sure. Let's say a patient's potassium level gets too low. Okay. This is called hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Yes. Okay. And it can cause all sorts of problems. Like what? It can cause muscle weakness, Okay. fatigue, uh -huh. and even heart rhythm abnormalities. So it's something we definitely want to avoid. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> so we're managing catheters and monitoring for electrolyte imbalances. Now let's move on to the final element of Fast Hugs BID. D is for drugs and delirium. These are both important considerations in post-surgical care. Let's start with drugs. What do we need to be mindful of in terms of medications? Well, surgical patients often receive a lot of medications. Okay. Pain medications, antibiotics, <sighs> sedatives, you. and so on. And all of these drugs can have side effects of when they can interact with each other. So we need to be very careful about which drugs we're giving yeah. and how much we're giving. Right. We want to make sure the benefits of the medication outweigh the risks. Exactly. And what about delirium? Delirium is a state of confusion and disorientation. It's common after surgery. Especially in older patients. Right. It can be caused by a variety of factors. Bus Pain medication, huh? infection, oh. and sleep deprivation. So it's a multifactorial problem. Exactly. And what can we do to minimize delirium in our surgical patients? There are a lot of things we can do. We can try to minimize sleep disruptions. Right. We can reorient them frequently. Okay. We can make sure they have their glasses and hearing aids if they use them. Okay. And we can try to create a calm and familiar environment. Mm. So it's about providing supportive care. Exactly. So we've covered all the elements of Fast Hugs BID, yeah. from F for feeding, yeah. all the way to D, for drugs and delirium. It's a lot to take in. It is. But I think it's really helpful to have this structured approach to care. I agree. It helps us be more thorough and it helps us provide better care for our patients. Now, I know you've seen Fast Hugs BID in action mm -hmm. in your own practice. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of how it's helped you care for a patient? I'd love to share an example. We had a patient, nah, let's call her Mrs. Smith, who came to the ICU after a complex bowel surgery. Oh, wow. So she was pretty sick. Yes, she was. She was on a ventilator. She had multiple tubes and drains, and she needed close monitoring. Okay. So how did Fast Hugs BID come into play in her case? Well, it helped us make sure we were addressing all of her needs in a systematic way. Okay. So walk me through it. Starting with F for feeding, Mrs. Smith couldn't eat or drink right away yeah. because her gut needed time to heal. Right. So we started her on intravenous nutrition to make sure she was getting the nutrients she needed. Okay, that makes sense. Then A for analgesia. We gave her medication to manage her pain, and we carefully monitored her pain levels to make sure she was comfortable. Okay, but not overly sedated. Exactly. We needed her to be alert enough to participate in her recovery. Right. Next, S for sensorium. We monitored her mental status closely using the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay. We were watchful for any signs of delirium. Which could be a real setback. Absolutely. But thankfully, she didn't develop it. That's good. Then P for thromboprophylaxis, temperature and tubes. Okay. We made sure she was receiving medication to prevent blood clots. We monitored her temperature regularly, and we managed all of her tubes and drains carefully. So you're really hitting all those key points. We were. Then H for head up position. We kept the head of her bed elevated to help prevent ventilator associated pneumonia. Right. And we also monitored her hemodynamics meaning her blood pressure, yeah. heart rate, and other vital signs. Okay. Then U for ulcer prophylaxis and urine output. 
We gave her medication to prevent stress ulcers. Yeah. And we carefully tracked her urine output to make sure her kidneys were functioning properly. Okay. Urine output can be such a valuable indicator. It really can. Then G for glycemic control. We kept her blood sugar levels in a healthy range to promote healing and prevent infections. Okay. And now for the BID part. Right. B for bowel function. We watched her bowel movements closely and we listened for bowel sounds to make sure her gut was starting to wake up. And thankfully, she didn't develop any problems like ileus or gastroparesis. That's great. Then I have for indwelling catheters and imbalance. We managed her catheters carefully mm -hmm. to prevent infections. And we monitored her electrolytes to make sure they stayed within a healthy range. Okay. And finally, D for drugs and delirium. We adjusted her medications as needed, and we continued to implement strategies to prevent delirium. Wow. So you really went through the entire mnemonic. We did. And I'm happy to report that Mrs. Smith recovered well. That's wonderful to hear. She didn't have any major complications. Fantastic. We were able to wean her off the ventilator relatively quickly, and she was eventually discharged home. That's a great success story. It really is. And I think it shows how powerful Fast Hugs BID can be. Yeah. When you use it systematically, exactly. it helps you catch potential problems early on. It does. And it helps you provide comprehensive care. So would you say Fast Hugs BID mm -hmm. is a must-have tool for any healthcare provider working in the surgical ICU? I would absolutely recommend it. It's not a magic bullet, but it's a valuable framework that can help you stay organized and provide the best possible care for your patients. I think our listeners are going to walk away with a much better understanding of how to use Fast Hugs BID to provide excellent care mm -hmm. to their surgical ICU patients. I hope so. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on The Deep Dive. Until next time, stay curious and keep learning. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.